Hi, welcome to episode three of The Focus. I'm Aldo Rol. And I'm Horia Sloshansky. Welcome. So today we are going to start the journey on explaining uh, all of those balances that we've covered with you in the last episode. But before we do, do that is we thought that we needed a way to actually visualize in a better way, other than looking at one big mirror board or whiteboard, uh, we wanted to find a way to visualize the AO polarities in a better way. And we came up with this hexagon that Horia is sharing with us at the moment. Um, Horia uh, will take you through the thinking and we will link this to you, this to the polarity map uh, with, uh, we will link the, this to the polarity map uh, after Horia has explained the hexagons uh, that we're looking at. Horia. Mm. All right. Imagine this is a solar system and in the middle here, there is a star and we're looking at the star from above and there are planets orbiting around this star. So around where the first hexagon is of control and iron triangle and personal interest and safety and so on, that would be maybe the orbit of Venus. And then where the second hexagon of trust and agile triangle and organizational purpose and so on, that would be the orbit of say something like Mars. Uh, life is harsh in both Venus and Mars, but life is good on Earth. So what we want to hap have happen is we want to find ourselves in this thriving zone, the Goldilocks zone of good balance between trust and control, good balance between the Agile and Iron Triangle. So think of this visualization as a means of bringing together the various balances that are necessary. They are interdependent, but to better understand what could we do, it helps us if we focus our attention. So think of this as an attention focusing device so that we can better understand how do we create such balance in these various dimensions. Now, Aldo will now explain the polarity mapping technique that we've used to balance every single one of these tensions. Before we step into that, it's just, um, uh, Aurea talked about uh, it's, it being simplified. Um, it is just a picture of how we think it can be uh, viewed. If you have any other ways do you th in which you can think we can visualize how all of these polarities work in a, a very complex dynamic environment, we'll, re we'll be happy to get your input from that. Now, going back to the polarity map, if you can recall from last time uh, how we stepped through the polarity map um, and explained it, is that we used polarity mapping to figure out what that dynamic balance should be. And in this case, we've got the example of what we're going to be covering today with control and trust in the polarity map. But for all the future uh, polarities that we're going to be discussing that you saw in our galaxy view or the AO galaxy view is that we're always going to start with number one, which is the bottom left, which are the fears or the neg negative results from over-focusing on control. We will then discuss the desired outcomes of the other side of the polarity, in this case, trust. And we, we labeled that as desired outcomes, but this is the positive results that we get from uh, focusing on trust. Next panel that we will be discussing then is the risks when we have too much trust, when we overcorrect on, on the trust side. And that's just the, the types of fears uh, and negative results from over-focusing on too much trust or too much focus on trust. And then we'll go back up to the top left, uh, which, is, which we rename to benefits to be retained. But this is the positive results from focusing on, in this case, the control uh, side of things. Once we've gone through those four panels, we then want to summarize as what's that greater purpose statement when we have this dynamic balance? What is the overall purpose that both control and trust uh, focuses on? 
And then at the same breath is what are they both trying to prevent? What is the deepest fears or potential fears that they're trying to avoid when we look at the combined downsides of both? Once we've established that, we'll look at number seven and look at what are the actions and the skills needed in order to retain that dynamic balance between the two poles, um, as well as uh, for the overall purpose. And then lastly, we'll be looking at what are the measurable warning signs uh, when we start noticing the balance being slipping back into the downsides to ignite this potential fears. We talked about measurable warning signs intentionally because many of the warning signs we could either directly observe or actually have ways of measuring those. And that's why we called it measurable warning signs. Now, what we will do with each of those polarities is step through those eight, eight panels. And um, this is a way for you in your own situation and your own context to go and analyze how this could potentially, uh, um, how, how analyze in your own situation, what are the dynamic balances you need to look at attaining. Now, if we go back to our AO Galaxy view, Horia, if you just flick back to that, if you notice on the AO uh, uh, Galaxy picture, we have values and fears there, and this corresponds to number one, two, three, and four uh, panels inside the adaptive oversight picture. Ach, the, uh, sorry about that, about the polarity mapping picture that we've shown you earlier. And what we want to do, like Ori have explained, is to make sure that we understand what are the elements that we need to uh, bring into balance for your own situation. And that is what we want to look at in the thriving zone when we get there. Okay, Ori. All right, now. For this and subsequent episodes, in this episode, we're going to focus on control and trust, and we're going to give you a brief overview of the kinds of topic elements that are present in each of the quadrants, in each of the frames um, that form the polarity exploration for control and trust. In the next episode, we're going to pick another um, tension and so on. Now, we're not going to go into a deep dive in e each of the specific examples of uh, habits or actions or struggles or uh, desirable outcomes and so on. That can come later. So after we spend six episodes giving you an overview, during that period, uh, we're hoping that you, the audience, will have an opportunity to form some impressions as to which topic area would be most interesting to you, which balance you'd like to start a deep dive in. And then in subsequent episodes after that, we can dive into specific descriptions of situations, challenges, stories. We can have uh, people joining us um, to be interviewed and share their stories of um, oversight, struggle, and victory. And that's how we foresee the Focus podcast developing into the future. So what Horia has shown us there is, is that if you just zoom out a little bit more, Horia is out, yeah. There are, of the six balances, there's so much uh, ideas or concepts that could fit into those polarities and um, the polarity pairs that we probably spend a whole podcast series um, being able to delve into the minute detail of each one of those things. So the summary that Horia is going to be talking about uh, is the way that we thought it should be summarized. And we realized that even that may be flawed, we may find other ways in which we can summarize the research or the data that we've captured from the people that we've interviewed from the panels. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, Borea? The, the basic idea here isn't so much to look at something as a 
point in time research to be summarized, but more let's discover uh, how may we make this better? How do we make this more effective in people's um, ways of work such that oversight becomes more impactful or effective? So let's start by looking at the struggle patterns with control. What happens if we want to have a bit too much control? So there can be just before you go in there, um, you may want to ask us why this polarity. You may why did we derive at this issue or this polarity that we notice between control and trust? That's a very simple answer, Aldo. It has to do with micromanagement. Most every single one of us hates being micromanaged when we're engaged in intense knowledge work. Um, you hire me for my skill, for my expertise, and then you want to deny me that. The Tayloristic model of um, there will be some thinkers over there in the upper echelons of the organization, and there are the doers over here in the um, uh, coal face. Basically, the thinker and doer separation doesn't work well at all in knowledge work. So control and trust is a fundamental challenge. Uh, a lot of people are still behaving as if indoctrinated into the idea that, right, uh, I am in a position of authority. I must exert control. I must tell you what to do, as opposed to sharing intent and, and developing good trust in your competence. And history has shown us quite a lot of um, my, uh, incidents where decisions were too far removed from the actual front lines. This is another aspect of the control and trust. And that cost quite a lot of unnecessary loss of life, especially looking at what's happened in the First World War, is where were decisions made in relation to the trenches. And you'll find that it was literally 30 to 60 kilometers away from the actual front lines where the action happened. And that led to unnecessary loss of life. Subsequently to that, militaries have actually learned to embrace mission command to achieve this balance um, with control and trust, especially in very dynamic environments where things uh, constantly change. And by learning from those examples from history, also noticing that there are the um, inherent uh, impulse for people that's in control, like where I explain micromanagement, not trusting others to get to know what's best for a specific situation. Um, we believe this is, is a really important balance that you need to achieve within your organization. So we are going back to you looking at the first panel for uh, control and trust balance take it away all right so quick rundown of too much control well there are poor decisions being made we call them suboptimal decisions there's lots of distrust being sown by this um overabundance of control um, much of this control is uh, an expression of ego uh, i want to assert my individuality there are challenges of of leadership um, with this micromanagement. Um, I am in turn, I'm a manager, I'm a leader, I'm asked to achieve certain results. And yet, uh, I feel that uh, people don't seem to, to care, don't seem to be engaged, don't seem to have the competence. Therefore, I will feel that I must exert more control. Um, there are challenges around um, friction due to rule driven, uh, bureaucratic exchanges where uh, we're just doing things because, hey, the rules say, um, and therefore we must uh, obey the rules, exert the control of the rules. There are difficulties around safety. There are difficulties around achieving good quality, right? Now, um, the next topic area is around the desired outcomes. What would happen if we had more trust, um, less overburdening control and more trust? Aldo. And that's usually put in, in, in contrast to the, the number one panel. And it's really interesting, Horia, that you touched on bureaucracy. You mentioned in the beginning about 
you, you talked about micromanagement, but I noticed a, a little bit of an, a, a, a story around this rule driven specifically is that I noticed with the pandemic uh, and organization, um, they, they, they ended up um, printing some posters and then noticing uh, to for, for notice, uh, letting people know about maintaining a specific distance, uh, social distancing and all and how so many people allowed in the kitchen at any given time. And what they ended up noticing is, is that people did not actually follow those guidelines. Then they ended up printing more posters. So by the time three or three or four weeks into the pandemic in the workplace, people didn't notice the posters anymore. So it's just that's a, just an, an example of how control and trust just went absolutely uh, haywire. Now, coming back to the upside of trust. Um, or the positive net results of trust. Um, what we notice is that when high trust environments exist, there's a real clear intent uh, about either the project or the pr product or the organization. They've got a real strong, uh, clear intent of what they stand for and what they're doing. Associated with that is also a very clear indication of the impact they wish to achieve as well as the value they bring uh, to the, the customers or the environment or the or society in large. Um, with that, if there's high trust environments, and we, we notice this with the SEALs, the Navy SEALs, the examples that's been given there is the high degree of excellence that goes with that. And then obviously, because trust is here, uh, trust uh, is also part of the, uh, uh, the, the things that we notice in high trust environments is there's all aspects of trust um, uh, that, uh, that, that is displayed. The next thing uh, around trust is that um, you, you see that little things like management trust first. So it's those little um, behavioral elements that around trust that uh, builds trust as well as uh, uh, show through leadership, how you actually um, lead by trusting first. The next thing is, is this high visibility in the organization uh, around uh, decision making and transparency uh, about the actual truth. So nobody is hiding uh, the actual progress of a project or whether a project is in trouble or whether they made a mistake. That's not being hidden. That is very visible. Another aspect of high trust environments um, is the organizations, the teams and the individuals are able to learn fast. So there is a, a pressure in order that they, in, in, that, uh, that they show in, um, to learn fast so that you can improve fast so that you can actually become even better. And again, it is a link back to excellence and value and impact. The other thing uh, as well, uh, and these things are all interconnected in the end of the day, is what we saw practices and um, uh, habits that build consistency in what the teams or the organization does. And then they have very good and strong risk um, uh, awareness. Um, if, if you've got more awareness of risk, you can afford a little bit higher trust in that environment. Now, looking at the downside of uh, trust, and this is where I'm going to be handing over back to Horia, is we're now moving, if you recall, from the top right of the polarity map down to the bottom right of the polarity map. Um, just as a reminder, we're looking now at the downsides of trust gone rampant. Trust without control, Horia. Right. So that's this bit about risks when overcorrecting. In other words, we've let go of control a bit too much, and we're going, whoops, uh, we're trusting all these people, and yet, ah, look, we're losing so much stuff. So there's lots of challenges around loss. Um, humans are psychologically programmed to be averse to loss, we are fearing loss way more than we're anticipating gain. So that will have a, an outsized impact. 
Then uh, related to that, there's a lot to do with hesitancy. Um, uh, there are challenges in that space. There's groupthink, uh, where we have um, numerous people falling into line and synchronizing on not so good ideas. We have misbehaviors of various kinds, and we have challenges of complexity. What happens when there isn't enough clarity of purpose and focus and control, things can get confused and um, delayed through complexity. So the next bit is what would be the benefits to be retained? In other words, moving away from those um, challenges of overcorrection, what are the benefits to be retained? In other words, if we bring ourselves back into balance, uh, what would we get with Yes, a good degree of trust. However, also with good control. What would happen then, Aldo? Yeah, when we uh, did the panel um, uh, research with the panel uh, panels across the world, um, uh, from across the world, um, we had quite a lot of fun. There was quite a lot of laughter with some of these things, especially on the downsides. You can imagine that there was quite a lot of examples that people um, used with the types of behaviors that they've noticed and observed in and phenomena, phenomenon that they observed in their working careers and working with different types of customers. So look, coming back to what's the upside of control, um, it does give us quite a lot and it is really useful having these upsides in control. And that's, uh, th that brings it into perspective is that we need to balance control with trust. So the first one is, is that sensitivity. It gives us, having control gives us a sensitivity um, when things change. It's not just plodding along. It actually gives us enough sensitivity to um, no notice and then adjust. It's also adaptive. So when you look at the work from David Mulcahy, he talks about tuning control to uh, two other factors, uh, which uh, has got to do with the actual capability of somebody, uh, as well as the conditions. So you would actually, like a dial, you would dial control up and down. So we say that good control needs to be adaptive as well to the changing circumstances. It's not a one size fit all. And if somebody is very capable uh, about doing a specific task, you can actually tune control down a little bit because that person can be trusted. Um, control, continuous improvement um, and control has got a really interesting link uh, for us. And this um, we see in the way that we don't make big changes um, because that means you would lose control, but there's a lot more value in making small incremental changes as we go along. So continuous improvement work really hand in hand as a control form or a control mechanism uh, in order to systematically become better at what you do, as well as keeping control and trust in balance. Control, uh, good control is also very aware of the impact it has across the wider ecosystem it operates in. So in other words, um, if control is uh, too excessive in certain areas, the impact would be very visible, it would be very evident, and this will allow, again, linking back to sensitivity, this will allow those people having the controls the knobs that they can tune that uh, down a little bit. So the impact of the control is, is very clear. Control also helps with acumen. Um, and this uh, helps to build that deeper learning, that deeper skill set uh, in your organization um, and in your teams as well. And then closely linked link to that, as well as is once you've got that deeper acumen, you actually have deeper resilience in the organization if you've got the right level of control uh, in place. Again, not too much, not too little, because it can harm the resilience as well as the ambidexterity 
that's a big word for a Dutchman, and the dexterity of the organization. Um, and that means that you understand what the dynamic balance is in your context and you can tune control uh, accordingly. Now, what we wanna look back, look at next is once we've identified all of these up and down sides of the two polarities, the first thing that we wanna understand is what is the upside? What is the and thinking of both? What's the overall purpose or the aspiration that good control and good trust in balance can give your organization or is supposed to provide to your organization. Horia. Right. And this is where we notice that when you have a really thriving organization that has assessed well where to find balance between control and trust, you find people that really enjoy their work. You find joyful staff. You find that there's really good safety and transparency. You have the people um, know and connect with a higher purpose. And you see that in terms of outcomes, you actually have benefits realized from agility. Now, all of these overall benefits are threatened by a number of, of fears. And Aldo, tell us a bit about some of these damaging fears. So one of the things that we notice is uh, relapses. Uh, when it comes to control and trust getting out of balance um, and both of the downsides are being magnified, we get relapses. Um, and you'll, you'll see habits like people falling into older ways uh, of, of, uh, be, before you started making these changes or people may feel an intense loss of personal control and they will react out of that. So again, this is, uh, you, you'll notice a relapse into older habits. The other thing that we notice uh, is that, or that we, that we found in our research is that there is actually a form of paralysis. Because you're back, you've fallen back, you relapsed into old habits, is people sometimes may feel paralyzed or the organization may feel paralyzed. They may, it may, may look like they're stuck between two phases um, or two, two dimensions, if I can call it that, um, because I used the, 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 the metaphor of the solar system. We can talk about dimensions here, but you can see there's a paralysis. There's an inertia there uh, of the organization or people or teams struggling, not knowing whether they should turn left or right. Then we'll start seeing all ele uh, elements around failure. Um, and uh, fearing failure is really probably one of the biggest things. So they fear relapse, they fear paralysis, and they fear failure. So the fear of failure is usually manifested in quite a lot of different ways or habits uh, or behaviors that, that's observable. Then we'll cover that a little bit later. And then a really interesting thing, the most tangible thing is that we noticed is around remuneration. Um, and some people are called salary thieves. So they end up, they just turn up to work and just do the bare minimum. And that is a, a, one of the things that we, we noticed that when you've got control and trust that's out of balance, this is one of the fears is that... Um, the uh, remuneration would potentially start showing that. It's that mantra of, you tell me how you're going to measure me and pay me, and then I'll tell you how I will behave. Now, when we look at those types of things that uh, we want to potentially avoid um, when control and trust is out of sync, is what are the actual actions and skills that we can look at in our organization in order to maintain us or to keep us in that thriving or Goldilocks zone that Horia explained. Um, and this is where we can actually have real skills and actions that we can take in order to maintain that dynamic balance to enable our greater purpose statement, Horia. 
And um, central to keeping control with action in good balance is the concept we call host leadership. Um, a lot of people will be familiar with the idea of servant leadership, but we believe the term host leadership conveys the message a little bit better. Imagine uh, in a household, you're inviting people uh, 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 for a party and you're essentially playing the host. Um, to a large extent, yes, you are there as a host to be of service. You are providing an enjoyable service to the people that are visiting. However, you being the host, you will have some degree of authority. If some people are getting a little bit too rowdy, you assertively show them the door and they are certainly no longer going to be welcome next time. There is consequence to misbehavior when serving as a host. You're not being run over um, roughshod by the behavior of the people uh, in the party, you're actually having some degree of mana, of authority um, that is inherent in your role as a host. Maybe you need to just explain mana for our non-New uh, Zealand um, right. uh, viewers. In, indeed so. Thank you for that, uh, Aldo. Um, in the um, references to this podcast, we will include some links to uh, the various concepts and topics, and we'll make sure to include a, a beautiful uh, TED talk that explains mana um, very clearly from the perspective of a person of Maori uh, ancestry. In a nutshell, mana is a Maori concept. Um, the Maori are the... Um, native uh, New Zealand uh, people that uh, arrived in, in the New Zealand shores um, many centuries before um, the Europeans arrived in the 18, uh, sort of 19th century, 18 somethings. Um, so this ancient tradition um, of the Maori has this idea of mana. Mana is in some way a means of connection, a means of showing mutual respect, a means of showing connection with the land, the rivers, um, and other waterways, um, with your ancestors. Um, it's, it's a connecting concept, a connecting force that brings you together. So for instance, uh, I'm showing you mana by not looking down on you and um, not looking up at you. We're essentially meeting eye to eye. This is how we're reinforcing each other's mana. Um, it's in many ways uh, connected to this idea of inclusion that you see here um, as another category of types of techniques and actions and skills that could be, could be practiced. So um, think of mana as um, a concept similar in some ways with what the Latins called gravitas. Um, it's a sense of um, well-desired, well-earned authority and um, well-earned respect, if you will. Um, in our organization and throughout the focus, we believe that all humans are worthy of mutual respect for their very humanity. Now, where do we go from there? Well, um, that will depend very much on how do we actually behave towards one another. And how do we learn uh, how do people behave? Well, we go to the Gemba, going to the Gemba. Uh, Gemba is a Japanese word for the actual place where something happens. The place of work is a Gemba. Uh, for detectives, a crime scene is a Gemba. So going to the Gemba, going to the actual place of work is very similar to um, what you see in shows like um, Undercover Boss, um, for instance. And uh, in Undercover Boss, you see the chief executive or 
chairperson of the board kind of going and spending a few days in the uh, trenches with the actual workers and inevitably they go, oh my God, if only I knew. And um, the, the audience is left nonplussed as to, okay, so why didn't you go before? Why is it only now that you're going and seeing and noticing how much more effective your organization can be when you're inspired by what is actually going on by noticing what happens? And this is not a new idea. You have, for instance, numerous stories and legends. Uh, you have uh, the stories of the, um, the wise vizier Harun al-Rashid, who was traveling the streets of Baghdad um, inconspicuously to notice what is actually happening uh, within the city and therefore being able to expose uh, corrupt officials and uh, and so on. So um, this is not a new idea. Um, humans have been practicing this from time to time. Um, what we're doing here with um, the focus is we're hoping to revive some of the wiser actions of our um, uh, ancestors and practice them more um, effectively, be more focused in their practice, if you will. Now, um, awareness building more awareness, paying better attention, having better transparency, uh, being insightful in how we approach uh, remuneration and compensation for people. How do we appreciate people? These could be really good um, actions and skills. Now, um, how do we know when we should engage certain of these skills? This is where warning signs come in. Aldo. Well, we notice the, these warning signs, these are signals um, that tells us that something that we've had in balance before has now uh, has, is running the risk of becoming out of balance. And these are the things to actually observe, notice, and then use that to go and find out what is the new adjustments you need to make in order to maintain that higher order balance that you uh, in the thriving zone. So one of the first things that you would actually notice is all sorts of types of conflict um, that you would notice. And it's not just actually active conflict. People will not, you, you will not just see uh, conflict. Um, hopefully you don't see chairs flying uh, in, in, your, in your office. Um, that's the last thing you want to actually have as conflict. Um, but you will see all sorts of conflict uh, patterns or uh, behaviors expressed as conflict, um, you'll notice some passive aggressiveness as well as uh, bullying and, uh, uh, you know, laziness, etc. Another thing is, and this is where that was a world that opened up for me when I started uh, reading up on David Marquet's work, is this uh, how language is actually being used and that's a dead giveaway, uh, listening to what people are saying. Uh, there's real clear signs that something is out of balance in the way that people are using the language in the, in the workplace. And we have some examples there, but it's really, it's one of the first cues that you pick up. Even if conflict is suppressed, the language gives you a really good indication of something is out of balance. You'll also look at uh, inertia or even avoidance of conflict. So that's the opposite of conflict. People will go out of their way to avoid conflict. So they would be all forms or examples or behaviors around inertia. One of the things uh, that really uh, always strikes me when I walk into an organization is and it's a dead giveaway is there's an absence of energy. There's, the, the buzz is gone. You, you don't notice a buzz. That's a sort of a, you feel it in your stomach. You can't put your finger on it, but it's just so noticeable that there's no buzz in the place. And that's usually a sign that something may be out of, out of sync or maybe something isn't balanced. And then you see all sorts of other avoidances, not just avoidance of conflict, but also other forms of avoidance. 
um, learned helplessness is, is, a, is a great example of that. Um, you also see uh, some teams are selfish. Uh, that's mentioned in there. So stepping through these eight panels gives us an, an idea or, or, or builds up a picture for us uh, when we look at control and trust, what is it that we potentially can have in terms of a dynamic balance as well as what are uh, imbalance in control and trust. Now, I realize that this research may not be exhaustive. You may be able to add quite a lot of other behaviors or habits that you notice in organizations or even other phenomena that we have missed. And the invitation here is if we've missed something glariously, glaringly obvious, please, Come tell us, we would like to actually expand this and make this better for everybody. Actually, so you can use this as a playbook in your own in your own context and go, oh, do I notice any of these? Yes or no. And then that will give you an idea of what it is that you can actually go and look at and then systematically try and improve to live in the thriving zone with control and trust. Hurry up. Right. Just to be clear, um, we're not suggesting that in your organization, you have to find most or all of these items. As a matter of fact, um, if you are tempted to use the adaptive oversight approach, we would recommend that you invite someone to facilitate this process. Uh, for you. Uh, we'd be delighted to help you in that process. And what we would do is we would start with a blank slate. In other words, all these eight frames for control and trust would be empty. And we would co-create a sensing initiative whereby we notice what do we see together in terms of the current struggle patterns with control in our organization. What do we notice right now, right here? Now, if we're stumped and we go, damn it, nothing comes to mind, then we can actually take a look and say, anything around distrust? Oh, yeah, there's this and this. Well, anything around leadership? Oh, yeah, there's that and that. Anything about rules? Oh, yes, now that you mention it, there's this, this, and this, right? So think more of these topic areas and examples as memory joggers to say, have you seen one of these before in this organization recently? Oh yeah, I've seen one of those. Okay, cool. So we have that. Yeah. And similarly, that's what we've done with the research. We've, uh, we've proposed this as memory joggers. Now, we are fairly certain that we've missed quite a lot of nuanced happenings in people's organizations, of course, because we couldn't be everywhere. But we've had at least 20 years worth of exposure to lots of organizational shenanigans, uh, every single one of us. So that compounded makes for hundreds of years worth of experience because we've validated this with two dozen experts at the peak of their uh, careers. So that is a lot of insight, a lot of work that went into all of these um, elements. So think more as, a, as an attitude, we want to build together an image of what are the struggle patterns? What would we want to see instead as desired outcomes? What could be some risks if we're going too far with letting go of control? What are the benefits that we want to um, retain out of really good control, balance well with trust. What's our overall purpose here now in this context? What do we see achievable as opposed to something that somebody says, oh, we will do blah, and everybody goes, no, we're not. That's too far. We, we don't know how to do that. We just, um, we're not comfortable going that far. Um, what are the fears that we're avoiding? What are we resisting, and then declare for ourselves, what are the specific actions and skills that we know of, that we're comfortable attempting, 
that uh, we believe are achievable for us. Because some of the suggestions here might feel a little bit strange or unusual. So for instance, people may not have heard of um, nonviolent communication or NVC and they go, what's that? And you might have to spend a little bit of time, effort and energy in learning and mastering some of these tools, techniques and skills in order to get the benefits uh, from them. And finally, um, figure out what is the sensing system? What are the measurable warning signs in your particular situation? And this is going to be applicable to every single one of the tensions. As well as we gave you some ideas, if you've got actual experience of where you were in a situation where these were out of balance, where you had control or any and trust or any of the other balances out of balance, and you've actually taken some steps to actually get that into balance, we would love to hear from you. We would love to come at you to come and talk to us and tell us your story. It's valuable learning for everybody involved. Um, and we believe that will continuously expand this body mm -hmm. of knowledge that, um, that we started to put together. Now, Horia, um, just going back to um, what it is that we wanted to cover today, um, I think we have covered everything related to control and trust. We've uh, talked a little bit about how, how we've actually shown how we've used the polarity map uh, uh, and, and how to actually apply the polarity map. We've also introduced our AO um, uh, solar system. Um, if, the, if you've got a better word for it, please challenge us on that. Um, but uh, on you, we've introduced the AO solar system. And now you have a, a sense of what is to come for the next number of uh, episodes in the adaptive oversight. So Horia, any closing remarks from you? Um, when you were saying solar system, a thought that came to mind was, this is a hexagon uh, and it's as if there would be six seasons. Uh, we're accustomed to four seasons, you know, winter, spring, summer, fall. But uh, if you had six seasons, this is what would happen, right? You move from this season to this season to this season, depending on where uh, in the orbit you are um, around the sun. So um, it's an interesting uh, extension of the, of the concept because what we have with adaptive oversight is you can't afford to just focus on control and trust. You also need to pay attention to the other uh, attentions as well. So this seasonality, if you will, uh, I thought is, a, is an interesting uh, sort of enrichment of the, of the model that comes to mind uh, with this. See, we, we, we've achieved a new insight today. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, I'm Aldu Rol. And I'm Horia Slushansky. Have a good day. Thank you for listening. See you soon.